there were people there from an organization called Generosity Path. And they work with a lot of high uh, value donors, people who are making huge decisions based on the wealth they've accumulated, based on uh, their position in life, based on their businesses. And they partner with another organization Scott and I are very close to, which is called the National Christian Foundation. So one of the stories that's been told by the NCF and by Generosity Path is the story of this business owner who came to, to his business with a steward understanding. He's going to be talking about some numbers uh, in U.S. dollars just to give you an idea of the equivalent. Uh, his company this year is on track to give away about 25 billion pesos since he founded this corporation. So you can do the math there. You'll see the value of his business that he's put entirely into charity now. And with that, let's show the video for Alan Barnhart. It's about 15 minutes. But, uh, no, it is a great joy to be with you and to share with you um, really God's story, a story of how an amazing God can use ordinary people, ordinary construction guys. And uh, it's been a fun story to be part of, and it's a fun story to share. I want to first introduce you to my family. You see them up here, and uh, I have an amazing wife, Catherine, um, who is a great adventurer. If I went home tomorrow and said, honey, I think God's calling us to Afghanistan, she'd say, let's go. In our business, we pick up and move heavy things. That's our, that's our industry. So we, um, we do a lot of work in the nuclear power industry. There's a few pictures from that. Let me go back and just tell you a little bit of my story. Um, I, I grew up in Memphis, came to Christ um, through a ministry called Young Life when I was in high school. I uh, went off to college at the University of Tennessee. And you know, a lot of folks, when they go off to college, they kind of shuck their faith and their morals. And for me, it was the opposite at time, opposite, opposite experience. Um, in college, I grew a lot in my faith. I learned to, to pray, and I learned to worship, and I learned to study scripture. And I had several uh, brothers in Christ who, who were walking together and pushing each other forward in our faith. And when I uh, was graduating from college, I'd studied engineering with the plan to go and work in the family business. And some of my friends were saying, Alan, don't do that. Go do something significant with your life. Go into full-time ministry. Go to seminary. And, uh, and I prayed about that, and I wanted to be in full-time ministry, and I wanted to be serving the Lord. And I was praying, and, you know, God, what do you want me to do? And the more I thought about it, the more I prayed about it, the more I realized that, that all of us who are followers of Jesus are in full-time ministry. And you know, you, you don't have to draw your paycheck from a charity or a church to be in full-time ministry. We're all called to be full-time serving the Lord with whatever skills and gifts He's given us. And I felt that God had gifted me more in the area of business and engineering than He had in preaching or teaching. And so I, I decided that, that was the path for my life. So I, so I uh, came back to Memphis and joined the family company, which was a very small mom-and-pop business. The international corporate headquarters were two bedrooms of our home that I grew up in, and it was, it was you know, ten, about ten employees, very small company, um, and, uh, and, and started working. But I learned to study Scripture in college, and so I decided that I would study through the Bible and read every verse I could read about, about business and about money and wealth, because that's the field that I was going into. And part of the whole purpose of business is to make money. So what does the Bible say about money? And I went through the whole Bible over about a two-year period. And I'm an engineer, so I'm kind of cataloging verses and, and trying to figure out what the Scripture is saying. And I, and I came away from that study with two primary takeaways. And the first one is that everything that I have and everything that I am has come from God and belongs to God. And I am a steward of it. And my job is, is to figure out what God wants me to do with the things that he's given me. None of it belongs to me. I have no rights. I'm a steward. The second one may surprise you a bit. The second one was I came away with a fear of wealth, a fear of, of business success. Um, if you start thinking about the scriptures, how many scriptures really would point to that fear? There were many of them. You know, Jesus said it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Why did he say that? He said, he said, don't store up for yourself treasures on earth. You remember that? He's, he said, he told that parable of the four soils. And the fourth soil is the one that we want to be, the fruitful Christian, the fruitful hundredfold, sixtyfold um, uh, 
fruitful life. But the first three soils didn't bear any fruit. And the, the first two of those soils didn't worry me so much, but the third one was really scary because it said, I mean, it was good soil and it was a good plant, but there was no fruit. And do you remember what Jesus said about it? He said, the problem here was the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of wealth choked out the fruitfulness of the plant. And, and as a 23, 24 year old kid reading these things, I didn't want that to be my fate. Um, there was another uh, section in 1 Timothy that was pretty scary. Let me read it to you. It says, but godliness, godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, we can take nothing out of it, but if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. And listen to this. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. I didn't want that to be my, my story. Um, during that same two-year period, I fell in love with Catherine, and we got married, and we uh, um, tried to start, we started planning our life and uh, started hearing about people around the world who had never heard the gospel, who had never heard what Jesus had done. And in fact, some countries where, where um, they didn't welcome people coming to tell that story. Uh, they didn't allow missionaries to come, but they allowed engineers to come. And so we, we decided that we would go um, as sort of undercover missionaries to Saudi Arabia. And we started planning to do that and trying to learn Arabic and get ready to go to Saudi Arabia. And then during that that year, we got married and we were taking a year um, of preparation time. And during that year, my parents came to us and they said, we've, we've decided that we're going to leave the business and we're going to get on a sailboat and sail around the world. And they did. And they, they were gone for most of the next seven years doing that. And they said, if you want to go on the mission field, then, then we'll just sell the business. But if you want to stay and, and you can start your own business and do some of this uh, kingdom things that you've been talking about. If you want to do that, then you can, then you have that opportunity. It's up to you. And so we prayed about it and tried to figure out what does God want us to do? And uh, frankly, we weren't completely on the same page. Sometimes we would kept voting and it kept being one to one. And, uh, <laughs> and, and we, we weren't sure, we weren't sure what, what God wanted us to do, but more we prayed, more we decided we would end up staying in Memphis and, and trying to start a business. But because I had had, I had read all those scriptures and had that fear we said, before we're going to start this business, we're going to put some safeguards in our life. And so we put in three or four safeguards. The first thing we said is that I was starting this with my brother and his wife, and so the four of us got together and we said, first, this is God's company. God owns this company. It's not ours. We all agree. Second, we're going to, we're going to set for ourselves a lifestyle finish line. We're going to pray and ask God what kind of lifestyle he wants us to to have, and then we're going to cap that. And if God chooses to prosper our business, we're not going to do what comes naturally, which is to ramp up our lifestyle. Instead, we're going to see it as an opportunity to take these, these funds that are, that are coming in and use them uh, to advance the kingdom rather than to advance our lifestyle. So we've set that cap. And the third thing we did is we built some accountability into our life. Um, it's easy to make a decision like that, it's hard to stay with it over the long haul. And, uh, and particularly in this area of money, um, your church may be different than mine, but if I were to, if I were to sin openly at my church in some areas, um, if, I were to, if I were to come in bragging about cheating on my wife or bragging about doing drugs, there, there are brothers in Christ who would come and rebuke me and would help me uh, repent and get back on a better track. But, but if I were to sin in this area of money, if I were to take more of what God uh, has given me and, and consume more of it on myself than I should, no one in my church would rebuke me. I'm afraid they would actually congratulate me for what, for what I've done. And so there's not a great amount of accountability, so we knew that we needed to build some in. And we did that by, by really telling some other people in our business about what our commitment was, some of the other people that worked there. And we said, the fruits of your labor will not go toward increasing my lifestyle, they will go to, um, to helping other people and to uh, advancing the kingdom. And we want you to hold us into account for that. Um, so now we, we were ready to start our business. We had set these 
guidelines in place or these safeguards in place and we started our company. Um, it was very small, again, just uh, 10 guys in Memphis and we didn't know if we would even survive the first year because it was a mom and pop business and mom and pop were leaving. And, uh, and we, but the first year we actually made some money and uh, we were so excited, we were able to, uh, we had $50,000 extra money that we were able to give away. And we got to, we, one of the other things we said on the front end is we, if we do have any money to, to invest, we're gonna do it as a group. And so it started out, there were six of us that got together and prayed and said, God, what do you want us to do with this money that you have generated? And we took it and we gave it away. And the next year the company grew some more and I think we had $150,000. And, and each year the company just continued to grow and it grew about 25% a year for the next 23 years. And for you math guys, that means it was 100 times bigger than it had been. And went from a very small company in Memphis to a company that works all over the U.S. and has about 1,000 employees. And, uh, and, and our ability to give greatly ramped up. I mean, we got to the place in the early 2000s where we, were, we, had, a, we had a million dollars a year to invest in the kingdom. And, and we had a much bigger group now trying to help us figure out how to do that and praying and saying, God, what do you want us to do? And uh, in 2004, one of our guys said, we ought to set a goal. He was a salesman, you know how salesmen are. We ought to set a goal to, give, to, to be able to invest a million dollars a month into the kingdom. And we thought, eh, yeah, okay, whatever. And, uh, but the next year, our industry just started booming. 2005 to 2008 were great years in our industry. And, and we went from a $50 million company to a $250 million company during that four year period. And, uh, and throughout that period and ever since, we've been able to invest over a over million dollars a month into the kingdom. And we're just amazed at what God is doing. We had no vision for this, no thought that this would ever happen. And God has just chosen to pour out um, uh, a huge amount of business success on our company. One of the things that happened in our company is it became worth, the company grew and grew and became worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And we, um, we had set out to safeguard ourselves against wealth. And, and yet, uh, as far as we were concerned, God owns this company. As far as the IRS was concerned, my brother and I each owned half. And if one of us were to have died, uh, you know, there was all these estate tax issues and, and the company kept growing and we weren't sure what we were gonna do. And so we started trying to figure that out. And as some of you know, that's a cumbersome and expensive process. And we said, you know, this all belongs to God. Let's see if we can find a way to give it away. Let's just give it away. And we, uh, we went to advisors and said, we'd like to give our business away. And, and they thought that that was uh, imprudent. <laughs> they thought that was not something that we should do. Um, and then we connected with the guys at the National Christian Foundation. And we, we said, this is what we want to do. And they explained to us pretty quickly how we could do it. And uh, so in, in 2007, at the end of 2007, at the beginning of 2008, we took 99% of our company and put it into a charitable trust irrevocably. And, uh, and we continued to own 1% of the company that had the voting rights of the business. And so we were able to continue to operate the business like we always had. But if one of us died, there wasn't gonna be a huge estate tax issue. And then just uh, last year, 2012 actually, we, we gave away the last 1%. So now we own nothing, um, but we never felt that we did anyway. We don't own any of the company, but we still have the voting rights. We still operate the company and control the company. And we can actually transfer the company from one generation to another or from one or to a leadership team or whatever. With We could transfer the stewardship of the business um, for years and years and years um, without, having to tra without the expense and the danger of transferring the wealth of the business. Um, all the while, we have continued to live the same lifestyle that we, that we started with. And, and that has been a great joy. Um, it has been a great benefit, I think, frankly, to my children to not have to grow up as rich kids and to learn the, um, learn the word no and learn that they don't always get what they want. That was the theology from the Rolling Stones that I taught them. You don't always get what you want. You know that little song? <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, it's not just the no. It's the alternative that they've gotten to learn because the alternative to consumption is kingdom investing. And kingdom investing is so much more fulfilling than consumption. And so my kids have been able to see the relationships we've been able to develop 
with amazing people around the world. When it comes to how much, what is the right amount, um, I, again, I think that we should ask the uh, owner. I think one of the one of the guidelines that we would have is, I would say, I don't think that the Army cook should eat better than the troops. Would you guys agree that the Army cook doesn't have a right to eat better than the troops? Sound reasonable? Um, if the Army cook kept all the good food back in the kitchen and sent rice and beans out to the troops, after a while, the general would not be pleased with what is going on there. I think there's a parallel. I think those of us who are in a position to, to generate wealth um, because, of the, because of the position that God has put us in, we're not entitled to a different lifestyle than the rest of the body, the rest of the troops. Now, we need a different set of tools. The Army cook needs some very expensive kitchen equipment to do what he's going to do. And we, need, we may need different tools. And, and, and so how to decide what tools are the right ones for us by asking the owner um, and talking to the owner um, that would be sort of our basic philosophy as how to do it. We, we don't have a, a formula for any individual, but that would be our basic thought pattern. Uh, I think being a kingdom giver, a kingdom investor, has been so much more fulfilling than any of the stuff we've passed up. We've passed up some stuff. Our lifestyle doesn't allow us to uh, do some of the things that, that others do, but we've passed up none of the good stuff. And the alternative, the trade-off, has been so worth it. So my life is not some sacrificial life. The journey that we've been on has not been a sacrificial journey. Um, our lifestyle is not some Mother Teresa lifestyle. You heard, you know, we heard some of the statistics about um, the, the poverty in this world and, and uh, how the average person in the world lives on less than $1,000 a year. And our salary is $140,000. And so we're not living some, some sacrificial lifestyle. Um, but at the same time, we are able to take um, the skills and gifts that God has given us, put them to use, work hard, try to be as good as we can at what we do, and, and then not get caught up in the stuff and in the toys. And I think part of our business success, our secret to our business success is I spend very, very little time acquiring and maintaining toys. Um, and instead, we try to um, take the, the resources that God gives us and turn them into tools for the kingdom. So that's, that's been our journey, and I appreciate the opportunity to come and share it with you. Thanks. So Sean made a comment that um, I want to just, just talk about here real briefly, especially since many of you are either in or training for the pastoral ministry. Um, but I do, um, I do some pastor's conferences about this whole idea of, of being a steward, a steward pastor. Um, and one of the things we talk about when we come to money is I ask the question, do you know uh, what your people give? And I usually get this look of horror from my past pastors. Oh, no, no, I don't, I don't want to know what, our, I don't want to know what my people give. So, okay, let's, let's talk about that for a minute. Why don't you want to know what your people give? Well, before I ask that question, we usually do a little look at the scriptures and say Jesus seemed to be very concerned about how money impacts our spiritual life. Do you believe there's a link between your spiritual maturity and the way you handle your money? Absolutely, right? It's all the way out through scripture. The two of them are integrally tied. Do you think if you're having spiritual issues with regard to money, it will show up in, by the way that you spend your money? Right, the two are very tightly linked. So if, if the way you handle your finances is at least one indicator of what's spiritually what's happening in your life, then why wouldn't you want to know that about your people? Well, what's the normal response that a pastor will give? It's this idea that if I know what my people give, it will impact or change the way I view them, right? And we'll let that sink in for a minute and say, okay, so what you're saying is that you could have a, a man from your church come in and sit down and say, Pastor, I'm having an affair with, on my wife and I need to talk about it. And that would be okay. That wouldn't, you wouldn't change your view of that man. Should he come talk to you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, he should come talk to me. Um, if, if a man is embezzling money at his business, 
and feels badly. Should he come to his, talk to his pastor about it? Would you be okay? Was your door open? Oh yeah, my door's open, absolutely. They should come and confess. And you can go through this big list of all the sins that somebody could do where a pastor would say, yes, they should come talk to me because I'm their pastor. I want to know. I want to pray with them and help them. But if I know what they give, well, that will change the way I view them. Isn't that ironic? Isn't that strange? But I've had pastors say, yeah, but that's true. That's true. I can know all these other things about you and minister to you as your pastor and not change the way I minister to you. But as soon as I know what you give, it's going to change my relationship. That is the power of money in the church. And we have got to come against it and we've got to rebuke it and we've got to do something very different. I believe very strongly that pastors should know what every person in the church gives. And they should watch what people give in terms of their patterns because if I'm giving regularly to my church and all of a sudden for three months I give nothing, I, I would expect my pastor to call me. Say, Scott, is, you guys okay? I know you guys give regularly and nothing's happened. Are, are you okay? Did you lose your job? Is somebody sick? Are you having struggles? You know, how can I, how can I help? Isn't that what a pastor should do? But not many do that. It's a big challenge, isn't it, for pastors? And I know that it is. But I want to put that in front of you to say that if you're one of those that says you really don't want to know what your people give, go find the root of that. Because I don't think you can adequately minister to your people if you take that whole financial part of their life and just say, I'm not going to deal with that. I'm not going to deal with that. I go on, I just get myself in real trouble. Because I go on and I tell pastors, I actually think that once a year, you should meet with everybody in your congregation individually and go over their tax return. And look at how they spent their money and look at, look at well, how much they brought in and where it went and how much they gave and help them to be faithful, joyful, free stewards of what is God's. Why wouldn't a pastor be involved in that? Kind of hard though. So that's the work that we have to do. And why I'm excited for all of you, because if you get this, if you really get this and understand this and can be evangelists in the Philippines, for other pastors to be able to get it and understand it and be challenged by it, we have a chance here to make a real impact. And that would be my prayer. Does that make, make sense? Okay. Thanks for the video. Did you enjoy that? It was helpful, wasn't it? Very well, very good timing on that too.